Welcome to another edition of Success Talk. And today, you know, we have some exciting guests, and each guest brings something special to our program. Today, we have Derek Phillips, and he is a young man, an educator, but a person who is making a difference in the lives of many young men, and a person who has had challenges, made breakthroughs, and still rise. I love that. And still I rise. Derek, welcome to Success Talk. Dr. Harris, thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate being here. Well, I've heard so much about the good work you're doing. And, uh, you know, I just take my hat off for the people who care about what's happening to our young people and do something about it. So thank you for all you do. Well, you're welcome. You're welcome. You know, Derek, I, what I love to do is um, we talked a little before, but a little about your background. Where did you grow up? Where was your early life spent? And sort of what set you on the path to become the Derek Phillips of today? Wow, that's um, born and raised in um, Brooklyn, New York. Um, I'm the, the youngest of um, four brothers and three sisters. And it's like when I look at my journey, um, you know, I look at the times that um, being the youngest, you know, I was like, you know, my mother, um, my dad was never involved in my life, you know, really had no impact in my life. And uh, my mother, I remember when I was younger, I didn't like to go to school. Mm. You know, I hated to go to school. And the crazy thing is that um, I was playing hooky from school in the first grade. In the first grade. In the first grade, I was playing hooky. Wow. I was playing hooky from school in the second grade. I actually got left back in the second grade, mm -hmm. you know, because I was not going to school. And there were instances where my oldest sister would take me to school and she would put me in my chair in school. And when she gets home, I'm home crying in the living room couch because my mother gave me a beating because I left school. I mean, I just, I, I hated school. I mean, they told my mother, let's say, he can just come to school for a half a day, you know, and we would be yeah. happy with that. But I said, okay, but I just yeah. didn't go to school. And the crazy thing is that, um, you know, my mother said, please just go to school. If you just go to school, I'll give you anything you want. Just go to school. And I just didn't go to school. And my mother ended up passing away when I was 10. Oh, okay. So my mother passed away when I was yeah. 10. Yeah. And, um, you know, and then I was started going to school. And the crazy thing is that I was going to school and um and I was staying with my sister, my oldest sister, who at the time was 26. She had three kids of her own. And mind you, um, she took all of us, my brothers and uh, my four brothers and my other two sisters. So she took all of us and she had three kids. You know, but I ended up and she was it was a dysfunctional household, to say the least. I mean, uh -huh. my it was really a dysfunctional household. But I ended up going to school and I was um, in the top class in the fifth grade, top class in the sixth grade and seventh grade, and ended up going to high school. Um, eighth grade, actually, I stopped going to school again. Uh -huh. And I missed 97 days from school and didn't pass that one class in wow. eighth grade. I missed uh -huh. 97 days and they promoted me to high school. In spite of that. <laughs> In spite of that, because of social promotion. So they couldn't leave me behind again. So they ended up sending me to high school. They sent me what they considered at the time to be one of the worst high schools um, in, in the city, Brooklyn, which is Thomas Jefferson High School. Okay. Um, so I ended up going to Thomas Jefferson High School. And I was, um, man, I was there. I went to school every day. Um, I was in college discovery. I passed every class. At graduation, I received, I don't know, maybe like 12 awards. Wow. Um, from high school in terms of community involvement, activities. So I was very actively involved in high school. Ended, ended up doing also, I did a commercial on Channel 9 um, while I was in high school about peace. Mm. You know, mm. so it was really at that point that my life sort of, um, you know, turned around. And it's just like, and yeah. I look at my mother and my mother was, she was, she, I know, you know, she's looking at me and she's saying, boy, that's that's my son. That's my yeah. son. You yeah. know, yeah. I didn't go to school end up going into teaching, became a teacher. You know, I taught history and I taught math. I was also an assistant principal. So here it is, a person that didn't want to school, didn't want to go to school, ends up um, being an educator. Well, you know, 
I mean, that's a super fascinating story, Derek. I, I, it's sort of going back to those times because I'm sure there are other young people that had that same issue, but it seems like there was something that caused a shift. So you, your first and second grade, you didn't want to go to school. And then uh, a couple of years later, you decided you liked school and you started going. Can you recall what was that, what caused that shift? Um, I think in the beginning, you know, and it's like sometimes I look back and try to think like what might have been that shift from my pers perspective as an educator. And I think um, the schools weren't engaging to me. Mm, okay. You know, and so when I look at it, because it's like, I didn't go to school, but here it is when I did go, I was still able to perform. Okay. At a high, at a high level. So it's like, here it is. If you have a kid that doesn't go to school, but yet when a kid comes, the kid performs. So yes. I think it was something in the school where it's like, um, I think I was a different kid. They didn't know how to really engage me. Okay. Yeah. And I think it was probably what shut me down where it's like, you know, I wasn't engaged. So yeah. You know, was, but, was there any one teacher that sort of stood out? Um, when I was in eighth, you know, and that's the other thing. I there was really no teacher in um middle school that I can say that was really had an impact and really turned me around. Um, and there was no one really in, um, in high school, I did have my teacher, um, Dr. J uh, Sharon Johnson, um, who's a guidance counselor, you know, who were really, she did, she did a lot in terms of student activities. Um, so she was really a person that really guided me a lot and helped me a lot. But um, in regards to teachers, I don't really have like, teachers that I can say, this is a teacher that I remember from high school. Mm. Uh, now, when we get to college, that's a little different. You okay. know, so college was different um, because in college, um, I had my professor Roberts, um, who was really, he was about 28 when he started teaching. Mm -hmm. um, well, he became a professor. So he was really like my mentor type big brother. Mm -hmm. And then I had this other professor, Dr. Moore, who was really um, that father figure for me. Mm. And he was really the one that was a father figure for me um, that really, you know, when I um, was in college, he had said to me, you know, you're going to grad school and you're going to apply to Wisconsin and you're going to apply to Albany. Um, so my question to him was, what's grad school? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, mean, I, had, I had no clue about anything. So he was the one that really, um, you know, my other Professor Roberts was that mentor and big brother, but this was a father figure to me. And it, which is a crazy thing is that as we're having this conversation, mm -hmm. uh, my professor Moore passed away um, about Thursday will make two weeks. Uh -huh. So and the thing with him is that he didn't really have, he wasn't really close to his family and his family's in Oklahoma City. And um, actually I've been um, planning his funeral. Wow. So I've, I've been, you know, part of a group and the lead person in terms of planning his funeral, I'm on his death certificate as the informant. Um, and we actually have a funeral for him that we actually um, raise money to have this funeral for him actually this um, Friday. Wow. So and he was at Father Figure. So that's the yeah, one. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, when I listen, I interview a lot of people and very often someone along the way, you know, Someone along the way made that difference and even saw saw the student in a far greater vision than the student saw for himself or herself. And it seems that was the case. They they saw something in you that said, come on. Now, now you know, you've been a, 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 an assistant principal. Yeah. And when I went to school, I remember the guidance counselor was a critical person. I mean, that was uh, the person who prepared you. Uh, you know, I'll date myself, but when I went to school in the South, black kids didn't take the college boards. We had our own college boards, something called the merit exam. I was actually the first kid in my county to black kids actually take the college boards. Wow. And so the, the guidance counselors, there was this, they were like critical people. I mean, you had like regular sessions with the guidance counselor and, she and, and it's funny they were. I seem like they were always, almost always women, but yes. it, yeah, it, it, yes, that's what I was thinking about. I'm like, yeah, but it, it they almost became an accountability partner. You know, we had the 
in those days, they'd have, I guess, different group one, group two. And when you would, especially in group one, group one was that group that was expected to go to college. Yeah. And man, they were on your case. You know, you had to see that guidance counselor at least every two weeks. Yeah. And I don't know that that happens now in school system. I, I know the schools, the systems we've been interacting with, you have one guidance counselor for 350 students. Yeah. Yeah. And you don't really have that. It's You don't really have that interaction. Um, the guidance counselor doesn't really have the same impact that in the past. So therefore, with a lot of students, the impact would really come from the teacher. So the teacher has more of an impact mm -hmm. on the student's success than really the guidance counselor. So it's like even with, when I look at with me, when I was um, teaching, I mean, I really had a close relationship with a lot of my students. And even today, I mean, I still have a lot of my students that I keep in contact with. I have students that are in their 40s, and I'm still in contact with them. I just got off the phone. As a matter of fact, one of my students, a former student, who was 44 this morning, you know, mm -hmm. just talking about um, a situation because I had another dad that was going through a situation. I said, I need you to call Javaro, who was my former uh -huh. student, who uh -huh. can guide you through your process. So the teacher has more of an impact now because guidance counselors are so overwhelmed with so many other things that they have to do. So the teacher has a strong impact. Yeah. I wonder why that is. You know, I, I won't, I don't like to speculate on motives, <laughs> but it's curious that over the years, guidance counselors have almost been neutralized that I guess they, yeah, they, they, whatever they were designed to do in, in the initial, you know, vision for a guidance counselor has definitely changed. <laughs> yeah, it, it, they're so overwhelmed. There's just so many things that they have to do, you know, and then the, the caseloads. They just have so many students that they're responsible yeah. for. Yeah, and I guess that's a budgetary issue. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we, we get the picture. <laughs> that's, that's a whole nother talk. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, as you were sharing, you know, and when we talked earlier, you know, I, I see a young man with a, a college degree and a, a advanced degree and graduate school and a principal, assistant principal. And, and, and she, you know, you would normally think, you say, well, I mean, he must have come from a good family. I bet his mom was a teacher and his dad was a teacher. And when you were sharing these early years, that was, um, there's something special about you and your environment. What was it that sort of kept you on the path because well you know and I know we work with when we work with young men when you have a very similar scenario so often the young men get lost in the sauce you know what well, kept and, you on the path you know what um like some I think for me which is weird is that um, I had a one of my friends his brother was actually in prison mm. and um his brother was in prison and his brother also turned into, became a Muslim. So he was introducing him to Islam. So, and he actually started, you know, giving us some of that information. So I started reading a lot of that in terms of um, Islam. Mm -hmm. um, so I was reading that and that sort of kept me out of a lot of trouble. I mean, <laughs> that kept me focused. That kept me focused mm -hmm. because in my household, I mean, in my household, so my brothers, I have one brother that died from, um, he froze to death in a house because he was, um, there was no one living in his house. So we had moved out of this house and he stayed there to sort of watch it for this the, uh, new owner. But he froze to death because there was no heat and he was drinking. He's, he was an alcoholic. So he yeah. was drinking. And when you're drinking, you don't feel anything. So he actually froze to death. I have another sister that died from alcohol and I was 12. She actually had a seizure in the house and she was on the couch and never woke up. Wow. I have another brother that died from, um, he was a crackhead. He was on drugs. Yes. My oldest sister who took us all in, who was a 26, was a functional alcoholic. And today she's not. I mean, she is, she's is. she gotten her life together completely. She's turned her whole life around. She's a church-going woman. So she really turned her life around. But that's what I grew up in. You know, so when I met my friend who introduced us to Islam, that sort of gave me a base. And that sort of kept me out of a lot of trouble. And um you know, that and the fact that um, I played basketball, I played mm. football. So I was really good in those sports. So yeah. after school, I was just playing sports all day. So yeah. the sports kept me out of out of trouble as well. Yeah. You know, so those are the things that just 
you know, kept me engaged. And it's like, I never yeah. had, even to this day, I don't, I don't drink, you know, even yeah. when I was in college, I didn't drink, I didn't yeah. talk, I didn't do any of that stuff, you know? Yeah. So, but those are the just kept me focused yeah, at that time. Well, you know, that's so powerful. Yeah. Because so often you hear uh, a lady was saying one day, she said that, that, that she grew up, as he said, in the mean streets of Chicago. And when I asked her that question, she said the thing that kept her out of trouble was engagement, piano lessons, sports, <laughs> okay, and activities. She said that, you know, her, 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 her mom particularly had her enrolled in everything you could sign up for, from the Y to, the, to you know, step classes, exercise classes, track classes, piano classes, yeah. you know, anything. And I'm making this point because so often in the field of education, they don't give these type of soft yeah. engagements, you know, mm -hmm. the credit that they do because if you go back and interview many young men and women who come from a, a challenging background, those who get through, most often there was a sports involvement, there was a religious involvement, a community involvement, and some type of artistic involvement. And so these programs, these after-school programs, even that give kids, yeah, give kids a chance to, to be engaged. I think you said it. If the school wasn't engaging you, it's like, why do I need to be here? And then when I can show up and, and get a grade as good as the guy who was here, <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that out. Like, I don't need to be here. I could be doing something else. <laughs> wow. Wow. So, you know, you moved in, in your, in your, in your professional arena as you, and, and being a black man, in the education arena. I know in the South, that's a rarity. <laughs> As they say, a rarity. <laughs> you know, that, you know, coming up, I grew up in segregated school system. And so you always had black men. The man was the principal, the assistant principal, the coach. You had many black men, male teachers. One of the things I noticed with integration yeah. was that over the years they phased all the black men out they retired and they definitely did not bring the administrators over i, I i'm in north carolina when they entered well first it took them 14 years after the supreme court decision to integrate okay and they fought yeah there's a if you ever uh, google it the wilmington 10 uh, the kids were treated so badly that they literally rebelled and i mean they were all sent to jail. I mean, they punished them like they were adults. Wow. It's, it's one of the few cases that Amnesty International took up their mantle, took up their case. And they were exonerated like 35 years later when they showed that one of the criteria for being on the jury was to be a Ku Klux Klan member. They had all the, can they, they found their actual jury sheets when they were selected. That was one of the jury. questions, <laughs> one of the criteria. <laughs> yeah. You know, wow. Yeah, yeah. They, they actually found the jury sheets where they checked the ones that were in the Klan. <laughs> you know? so, oh my gosh. So, so when we, you know, look at education and your position as a as a as a black man in the education arena, what would you say was your biggest challenge? You know, as you went from being a teacher to a principal, maybe you had different challenges at different times. But as an educator, wow. For me, as a um, you know, what's one of the, the biggest challenge, well, as a teacher, mm. I would say, um, I never had issues with students. Mm. You know, so students were never my issue as a teacher. Uh -huh. And the reason being is that, um, you know, and I would tell students like the first day of class, I'm like, okay, here's the situation. I'm your teacher, mm -hmm. you're the student, take that concept and throw it out the window. Mm. I'm a person, you're a person. You're going to learn from me and I'm going to learn from you. You know, so I really kept it really open. And it, so if I was putting something up on a board and the student says, ah, this is, I do it this way. And I'm like, you know what? That way is better. Let's mm -hmm. do it your way. So my thing was always about trying to empower students mm -hmm. and not try to feel like um, I had all the answers. Mm. 
Wow. You know, yeah. So, and, and when students, when you, when you, when you go with that mindset, like you don't have all the answers, and it's like, wow, you mean this? I, I can actually be the one with the yes, yes, and yeah. actually go with them. And a lot of times when I taught, I would also have them write an essay. The first week of class, I would have them write an essay, and I'll say, okay, this, um, the year is twenty years from today, mm. and where are you? Mm. And then I need you to write about how did you get there. Okay. You know, so, and it's like, so just having them reflect on their futures in terms of where they want to be. And some students would say, you know, I, you know, I want to be in music. I want to be in dance. Whatever they would use, I would make sure I read it and then make sure that when I'm teaching my lessons to incorporate things that they say where they want it to be. So like, you know, um, Tim, when you said music, right? So these are the examples of music, you know, so I'll try to incorporate that into the lessons as I'm teaching it. Wow. So you make them feel you know, wow, you know, you remember my stuff? Yeah, yeah. So it's like making them feel, you know, that they were um, a part of the educational process. So mm. in terms of obstacles, I mean, I wouldn't really say I had a lot of obstacles. I mean, you got to deal with obstacles in terms of just attendance. You got to, I mean, some people might say obstacles might be the challenges. Um, if students, some students might be perceived as being challenging. I don't it's you, you deal with people. So I've never really had any big obstacles in terms of just dealing with students. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, even with administration, I didn't really have any huge obstacles. Um, as an administrator, um, the obstacles, and even with the parents, as a teacher, as a, with the parents, never had issues with the parents. <laughs> mm, okay. You know, and the thing that I did with parents, I would call parents and say, um, you know, call a parent, yes, I'm calling you about your son today. Yeah. What did he do now? What did he do now? No, 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 no. We took a test today. He got a 95 on the test. Wow. You know, oh, uh, you know, guess what? Today something happened. He intervened and he actually had input. You're calling me about something good. Yes, I'm calling you about something good. So one of the things that I try to make a habit of is to call parents about times where the students are doing good in class. Wow. Yeah. There was an incident where it was something good because they're so accustomed to getting calls about the child is doing bad. So whenever mm. the phone rings, I'm already conditioned. Yeah, yeah. What is it? What yeah. is it? Yeah. You know, so when you get a call like, oh, he had a great day. What? He had a great day. You know, and that said a lot for the parents. It also meant a lot to the students. Wow. Okay. Yeah. It meant a lot to the students. Because like, yeah. oh, you called my mother because I did something good? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. You know. That, yeah. Now, that's a beautiful perspective. And, and I think... Parents would would look forward to those kind of calls. Oh yeah, and it's like and yeah. parents. I had, I mean, I when the parents come up for with educators, a lot of educators um, do not like open school night when the parents have to come up. Mm, okay, yeah. so they do not like it. Yeah, I, I loved it. Yeah, because it's like you know, I I loved it because one, a lot of the parents I knew because I already spoke to them. Yeah, so I already had a relationship. Yeah. So when they're coming up, we just pop, you seeing each other for the first time, but it wasn't the first time we're having a relationship. Yes. You know, so, and that's a big thing in terms of with teachers, because a lot of times teachers don't have the relationship with the parents, where they're really not engaging the parents. So if you really want to educate a child, you have to engage the child as well as engage the parent. Parent, yeah. So your school was, uh, I guess, uh, sort of neighborhood school, because yeah. you knew the parents from the area. I, I tell you now, the neighborhood schools in the South, have such a different connotation because I guess the neighborhoods are so segregated that if you had a neighborhood school, it's almost automatically going to be segregated. Yeah. Now the gentrification is taking place. I see it changing. And so the same school that uh, 15 years ago was fighting to just upgrade the bathroom. So, you, you know, like to, to just have a, a decent bathroom to go into uh, now are getting re refurbished, re you know, <laughs> <laughs> renovated, and all kinds of stuff. So, uh, you know, I, I guess that's just a part of the whole educational paradigm, you know, between the, the race issue and 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 the economic issue. The economic issue. Yeah. See, that's mm -hmm. the other piece. And, and then it's like on the other challenge, where one of the obstacles, you know, that I had as an administrator um, is um, the teachers. <laughs> mm. you know, 
So, and it's like, as an administrator, your job is to go in, I had to observe teachers. So I had to write up what, how their teaching was. So this was at a time also when we were dealing with a thing called the common core, where we had this whole new curriculum. Uh -huh. So the curriculum was based on um, teaching students to think. Uh -huh. Think at a high level. And in terms of teachers, what you needed teachers to do is that teachers had to actually teach not for um, teach so that students would learn and had to teach students to ask higher order thinking questions. Because when we grew up, one of the things that we knew is that um, you can pass classes based on memory. Okay. Yeah. So, and then, so you had a lot of teachers and when I was growing up and you it's like probably the same way, teachers would just write on the board and you're sitting in the class and you're just writing three pages, just copying notes from the board. Yes. Yes. You know, so that is not teaching. So we had this change because now what happened is that we have um, companies who were saying, so America was saying, how come you're not hiring our students? And you're hiring mm -hmm. all these other students from overseas. Well, uh -huh. there was the reason why we're not hiring your students because you don't teach them how to think, uh -huh. you don't teach them how to problem solve, and you don't teach them how to engage in conversation. Mm. Okay. So therefore, as an administrator now, my job was to, when teachers are teaching, they had to actually now incorporate um, questions that are not just yes, no, but they have to actually engage students in conversation. They have to engage students to think and they have to engage students so students will be able to problem solve. Mm. Because companies were saying, you know, I'm going to hire someone. I want someone, if I'm going to send you out there when you're talking to a client, I want you to ask questions. So what do you like? You like blue? You like black? Or you like the long sleeve? You like the short sleeve? So based on that information, now you come back and you develop products. Mm. So that's what it was saying in terms of the school system. You're just teaching kids just to memorize stuff. So you have to teach yeah. them how to think. So that was a transition for yeah. teachers. And here it is, you have a teacher who's been teaching for 15, 20 years, but they have the same lesson plan. They just do it out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the yeah. Plan. And they're like, no, 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 no. You have to kind of like, you have to do something different. You have to uh -huh. engage students. You have to, every, every lesson is different. Every class is different. Yeah. So you have to know your students. You have to ask them questions. You know, and teachers would say, well, I taught this lesson. It has nothing to do with teaching your lesson. Uh -huh. The most important thing is, did the students learn it? Yes. So yes. if they didn't learn it, yes. so it's teaching and learning, not teaching. <laughs> so that mindset is not teaching, it's teaching and learning. Wow. So that was the biggest challenge in terms of teachers because you have, they have to do things differently. Uh -huh. And for a lot of the senior teachers, that was um, a challenge. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah but, you know, when you've been doing it the same way all along and, you know, and somebody said, well, how's that been working? It's like, oh, I don't know now. Yeah, that's... <laughs> The companies are saying it ain't working. You know? No, it's not yeah. working. If you want us to hire wow. your kids, if you want us to hire, you know, your people, they have to be. And that's the thing right now when we talk about jobs. What they say, are you a team player? Yeah. You're asking questions. Can you problem yeah. solve? That's what yeah. all the yeah. jobs are looking for. So you can't go there with just yeah. um, I'm able to copy stuff from the board. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 I guess also a mindset, a work ethic mindset. You know, I. I look at um, like there's tons of construction here and uh, Sandra and I will ride around and we're looking on the construction crews. And if we see a hundred um, workers, we may see two black men, wow. maybe. Okay. And, and when we look at many of the workers and be around, we'll see many of them are foreign workers, you know, yeah. coming from other places. And so, uh, and and so that question arises now. So what is it about the American workforce that makes you think, you know, I'm sure money's involved because you can probably pay, you know, certain folks le less than um, than you pay others. But also there's that mindset, that 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 work ethic, that that, uh, you know, um, when I was a kid, it's like education was the answer, you yeah. know. And and not going to college was was not an option, you know. Yeah. Like it, it, either go or die, you know. Like real simple, <laughs> you know, you know, you know. And so <laughs> you had that mindset that education was the answer. And I guess over the years I've seen it evolve among the young people, and where now the the value of education has diminished in the mindset that I don't know if they see it as a solution anymore. Yeah, and, and that's um 
boy, that's that's a tough education. Is you know, I think education has um, changed to some degree, where in the sense that it, education is not, it doesn't have to be solely about a degree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So it doesn't have to be solely about a degree. So, but we want to encourage you to get a degree, but sometimes that may not be the path for certain yes. people. Yeah. So, and the funny thing is that even when we start looking at some of the millionaires, the billionaires in the world, right? Um, yeah. The Gates and all these, they don't have degrees. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They they understood, they found a niche and they worked it. Yeah, yeah. They, they don't have yeah. degrees. And even yeah. now with um, technology being what it is, uh -huh. um, you have a lot of young people now where um, companies want them from their, based on their experience, what they know. Uh -huh. so sometimes companies are not, some companies are not even requiring that you even have a degree. Right. If you, you can know, do if you can do the job, you got it. Yeah. If you can do the job because the challenge, and this is I would say for us in terms of being the um older generation. So you froze up there for a minute. I'll consider natives. Yeah, there you froze there for a minute. Oh, can you, you hear repeat me? Repeat that now. Repeat what you just said the last sentence or so. Oh, okay. I think um, this is probably the first time in history where I say the older generation are the immigrants and the mm. younger generation are the natives. Oh, okay. Think about That's, that. Yeah, yeah. Because this, how many times we're constantly going, even as an, I'm going to my kids on how yes. do I do this? Yes. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You know, with the phone, you know, like, and they can take a phone and they go, like, Dad, all you got to do is this, that, and the other. Like, really? You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and my generation, so many of my generation have just given up. You know, they say, Is it not, how do you keep studying? And I'm like, I want to keep be, I want to be viable. I want to keep doing things. And if, if you're not with it, this, this technological world will leave you right behind. You know, it has its pluses and its minuses, yeah. but you got to be aware of it and know how to maneuver. Yeah, yeah. Because it's like, yeah. but you know, before it's like when you have experience was considered um, a tool, a you know, something powerful. Mm -hmm. Well, I have twenty five years of experience, but the challenge with us as the older generation is like, wow, we don't have the experience. That's why a lot of us are being laid off at a higher rate. Yeah, and that's why they're bringing in a lot of the younger people as yeah. well. Because you know, when we were growing up, we brought stuff. What do we know? We have the manuals right in the packet, right? We yeah. read the manuals. They don't put the manuals anywhere. Nah, nah. Everything uh -uh. for the kids like boop, 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 boop. Yeah. So, so we're we're like we're like a football team in the middle of the game, and the rules have changed. <laughs> that's exactly what it is. It's like whoa. Yeah. Wow. Wow. You know, and, and it's like for a lot, of, and so it's like wow, because the, the last generation, it was about the experience and the, the fact, and that's why with our young people, when it comes to the older generation, in terms of that respect for your elders, they don't really believe that because they're thinking, I have all the power. Yeah, I have all the information. Yeah, yeah I don't need them. Yeah, yeah, information yeah. is power, right? We, yeah, we have yeah. that power and that wow. information. Now they have all that information. And they're equating it to power. So therefore, it's like in terms of the respect level, they're like, I know more than you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's it. Now, now, you know, Derek, I can see now in this foundation that you created, this the real dad network. Now, how, how did you go from school? What made you really create that that vehicle? What was the need that you saw that said, I need to do this? You know, and it goes back to um, when my mother passed away when I was 10. Mm -hmm. So remember when I said I didn't go to school at all, yeah. right? So now when my mother passed away, there was this big debate about who's going to take Derek. Nobody mm -hmm. wanted to take me. Uh -huh. So my sister took all my other siblings, but no one wanted to take me. And I remember the night before the funeral, my mother's funeral, you know, I said to myself, if I ever have children, I never want my children to have to go through what I'm going through where their dad is not there. Mm, okay. You know, yeah. so when I had my girls, I have two girls, they're 23 and 27 now, but when I had my children, I was very, very actively involved in their lives. 
I did everything, braiding hair, changing diapers, bottles, everything. Um, and what happens is that people start to see me and they would say, wow, you are Mr. Mom, you're Mr. Mom. And it really felt good to be called a Mr. Mom. Yeah. But yeah. then I start realizing I'm not a Mr. Mom. I'm a black father who is actively involved in raising his children. And when it comes to black fathers, we don't see them in that light. Yeah. So even when we see someone doing that, we say, you know what, you're the exception. I'm like, no, I'm not the exception. There are a lot of black fathers who are actively involved in their children. So what I started to do is that I said I wanted to change that perception about black fathers um, and that whole narrative. So I ended up doing a documentary. And this documentary was called Real Dads, Black Men on Fatherhood that had commentary by the late, great Ozzie Davis. And this was done in 2000. And this was the first documentary that ever focused on positive black fathers. You know, and then as a result of this documentary, I realized that men need a place to go where they can get resources, where they can get support, you know, and where they can just actually have real conversations. So I created Real Dads Network in 2004, mm -hmm. you know, so, and that was just to provide, and because that's it for me, it was also not having a father. And there's a lot of us who didn't grow up with fathers and we kind of like trying to search for answers. So this organization sort of presented an opportunity for men to just learn from each other to have a place to go to get resources and support. Women tend to have those um, spaces available to them, um, but men don't. Mm, uh, so yeah. therefore, um, that was a uh, basis for creating Real Dads Network. Yeah. And then you have that whole male, that that male chauvinist thing, you know. Yeah. It's like man never want, a man doesn't want to get directions, you know. I no, it's like <laughs> so man, the ego. We were led yeah. by the ego. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, man. My dad would drive right into the river, you know. Where <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you know, my mom could say, listen, Herbert, there's a river down here. I know where I'm going. I know where I'm going. <laughs> wow. So now, as you've started that, what has been a thing maybe that has surprised you most or impressed you most as you've been doing it over these last few years? Man, I would say... Um... The thing now is that when we were, we used to meet in, we have a, we have a real dad's club. Mm -hmm. um, we have a real dad's vote. Um, we have a real dad's week. We have a real dad scholarship, you know, and what surprised me most is that we used to meet in person mm -hmm. before the pandemic. We met once a month in person and the pandemic changed that. So we had to go virtual and we've been going virtual. We have not missed we meet every Thursday. We have not missed a week in March or make three years. We have men from around the country yeah. that are part of this club that yeah. join in on Thursdays. We have um, another one of our members is from Africa. We have another one from England, you know, so, and they just, it amazes me every week. And I get off the call, I'm like, wow, these brothers are still here. We have anywhere from 20 to 25 every Thursday. Yes. You know, and we just have, it's that support group, it's that brotherhood. So it surprises me that it's almost three years and we have not missed a week and these brothers are still wow. tapped in um, to what's happening in this club. Well, I guess, you know, even the pandemic has some good impacts. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it, it's funny when you, when you said that, it it makes it easier to me. You know, it, it, it removes the distance impediment, the transportation impediment. And now the technology is such that, you know, you it, it, like I, we could be sitting together right in, in your living room or my living room and, and, and have the same type of interaction yeah. that we have right now. And that that's, you know, something and that's going to be a powerful tool because many of the young people look to the Internet yeah. as their source of information. You know, they're not going to go somewhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and, and that's the most important thing with the club that we have is that we're there every Thursday. Uh -huh. So, you know, whatever you feel as though you know you need to come, you can drop in this month. You may not come back again to another two or three, four months, whatever. But we're there, you know. And that's the most important thing with men is that men need to know that there is a place that I can go. Uh -huh. And when I'm ready, when I need some support, when I need someone to talk to, I know there's a place to go. Yes. So, and that's been our mindset is that we're, we're there and we're not going anywhere. We've been doing this for three years. The organization has been around for next year, make 20 years. Wow. Yeah. 
So now, do you have special courses or special trainings for the for the for the men? Um, no, we just have the club. It's just open, and what we'll do with the club is that we'll just bring in bear. One week we'll have a barber shop, where it's just an open discussion, um, and then the next week we'll bring in speakers. So we cover everything. We've had um, we've had Sean from Boys to Men come in to speak to the group uh -huh. about autism because his son is autistic. Mm, okay. um, we've got Curtis Blow come and speak to the group in regards to dealing with um, heart taking care of itself in terms of heart conditions and stuff because he had a, he had a whole surgery. So yeah. we've had people come in speaking about um, how you deal with depression, yeah. and anxiety. Um, then we have a we have someone a speaker coming in talking about um, how do you build generational wealth. Mm, okay. Um, we have another speaker coming in talking about nutrition. So we talk about everything. Everything that relates to um, uplifting and building mm -hmm. um, fathers and families, we cover every gamut. Yeah, um, speakers. So the whole thing is about empowering fathers as well as families. Wow. Well, that's going to be a huge mission, it's, and it's going to get yeah. more and more needed as you see. I don't know. My perception of the the computer age, the cell phone age, is that the traditional family relationships have been diminished. Yeah. And so now people are sort of out there in cyberspace with, with that thing. What's the thing? I never tried it, you know. Oh yeah, that yeah that. <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah yeah. When when I when I was a kid and you put something else, it was a slide projector. <laughs> you know. That, the camera that, thing you put it in. Click. Yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> you know. It was a, it was just a way to see pictures that you'd taken in, you know, like almost three dimension, but. This is a whole nother world now. And so as men particularly become more and more disconnected because I don't see anything on the horizon in the school system and the, the K through 12 format that, that brings men together. Yeah. 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 And that's one of the things we're also trying to do, um, set up these clubs also in schools. Um, so we'll do things where we do dance at your child's school day. We participate in that. And we try to also, we've been talking to the chancellor in New York City about having these, what we call real dads um, in play program that we have to be in the schools so we can work with dads while they're in the schools as well. Now you have a center opening in Harlem, right? Yes. So we're fundraising for the center, a fatherhood and family center. Um, and we're looking to open it in April because again, one of the things is that when, what I've known with men is that they need to know they don't deal a lot with, you got to go here, you got to go to this, this. Give me a place where I know it's stable, it's centralized, where I know if I need something, that's where I can go. So mm. this fatherhood and family center is that space. So if you need something, you have a question, you know there's a space to go um, where you can call, you can come in, and you can get your questions answered. And then once they get their questions answered or information, what they do is that they go tell the next person, you know what? I was going through something. Um, you got to go to the Fatherhood and Family Resource Center. This is where they're located. They were very helpful to me. Then they start passing a word around, but they need to know that there's a, a trusted place. Mm, they can okay. go. Because with men, the big thing with men is trust. Mm. Um, you know, and you start dealing, when they start dealing with the system, you know, there is no trust with the system. We are a nonprofit organization. Um, you know, we're not under any systems, you know, and they know when they come, we're going to be real with them. Mm. Is there any particular age group that you relate to? <clears throat> we cover the gamut, you know, we cover the gamut. We have dads from 21 on, you know, until whatever age. So whatever, again, people come in, they'll drop in whenever they need, need support. Sometimes people will actually call. We have a phone number where people call and they might just be calling for a question mm -hmm. um, and we'll just answer their question. They may not ever come back. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes we have dads that are called and, and we have in a partnership with a, a, a lawyer who will give them free consultation, mm -hmm. you know, so whatever supports they need, we try to provide those supports. Um, and we'll get probably in terms of just dads, I would say for, we have about 150 in the club and then uh -huh. dads are just coming for just support overall. It could be anywhere from like a hundred a year. Okay. Wow. That's that, you know. And and really, I guess you're really making the rules as you go along. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, is there any, you know, when as as 
men come and reach out to you, is there any like sort of common problem or common challenge that brings them to this organization? Do they have um, to hit a rock? Do they have to have a legal issue? Well, it tends, what, mm -hmm. yes, what tends to bring a lot of them is when they're dealing with the issues of child support and visitation. Mm, okay. So that tends to be that, that tends to be the initial um, that draws them. But then now when it's going virtual, now some of them are drawn by um, some of the topics that we might mm. be discussing. Okay. You know, yeah. so someone might be going through a situation where they're trying to, we have, we have a whole um, Real Dads Building Generational Wealth workshop. So maybe they see the workshop and they'll come in because they want to be a part of the workshop and get information. So they're like, oh, wow, I'm a part of this workshop and you guys have a club. So that'll bring them in. Yes. Um, we have a book club. We've had a book club. We've had um, Kevin Powell who's spoken in the book club. We've had uh -huh. um, 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 Hill Hopper, mm -hmm. you know, so therefore, you know, they may say, oh, um, I want to be a part of the book club. And then that draws them in. Yes. So the fact that we have all these different things that are related to their life Yes. For life, whether it's, you know, dealing with health issues, um, that will draw them in. Yes. Well, now, I, so I volunteer. I'll be happy to come. And so you have a copy of the 12 Universal Laws of Success. Yes. yes, yes. yes. And I know our mutual friend Patrick has been teaching yes. from that book for years. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we're going to, I'll definitely put you on the calendar to come in and speak to the group. Yeah. Yes. Now, have you have you been able to use the group? Or what, what is your kind of experience with the book? You know, that since you've had it, um, any um, feedback on I've the had book? It. I, I've had it. I read the first, I think, the first couple of pages. Now I can't find my book. <laughs> well, it's a book that will disappear, okay? I, I, think <laughs> I can't find my book. <laughs> well, I, well, I'll be happy, and I shared with Patrick, because we used to teach in public housing, you know, young men, women, you know, we had a family approach. And so there's going to be some things we can collaborate on. We would love to, because even when we talk about the Fatherhood and Family Resource Center, it's going to be in NYCHA. Mm, okay. So Very it's good. going to be in NYCHA, so the public housing. So that would be a great place. Because um, Patrick gave me the book. I read it. Then I, I couldn't figure out. I got back home. I'm like, where's my book? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I've been looking for it. Now I just a couple of questions. We've had this has been a great time together, man. You've had such an interesting life, and and I'll call it an evolutionary life. That and and what I mean by that is, you know, when the system looks at people and they look at where you came from, your status, and they they have the well, it's like you know when they build the the uh, the 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 the. the 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 pipeline to prison <laughs> you know when, when they look at the number of kids in the third grade and they can sort of get an idea how many are going to be in prison 20 years from now if you look back on your life you know from the start and as far as you can remember what advice would you give your younger self that self that didn't want to go to school that self that uh figured it out really quickly that you were actually very smart <laughs> and, that you, and, that you, and that you could just show up and still go up you know what advice would you give yourself boy that's that's kind of like a tough one because when i look at where i am it's all of those experiences mm. that i've had to go through that brought me here mm. mm -hmm. yeah. you know so every everything with not going to school um you know mother not being there father really not being engaged um you know, being in a, a dysfunctional household, you know, so all those things. I mean, when I was 15, 16, so I'm the youngest of my four brothers and sisters. Uh -huh. And here it is, I'm 16, and I'm putting signs around the house saying we're going to have a family meeting. Uh huh. And, okay. you know, and I'm leading this family meeting at 16, and I'm saying we have to start saying when we get up in the morning that I love you to each other. Yes. You know, so when I look at all the things on my path, you know, and even, you know, I don't know if I would, I wouldn't really change anything because I think all those things made me who I am. Mm, yes. You know, so, yeah. you know, and the only, I guess if I had to give any advice to my young self, I, I, I just, I don't really know because it's like, I, I, you know, sometimes I do reflect and I reflect back on my life and I'm like, all those things made me who I am. You know, I'm a mm -hmm. retired assistant principal. I'm, 
I'm very community um, involved. You know, I'm, I'm really into just empowering people. And I've been this way uh -huh. since I was 16, 15, yes. 16. Yes, yes. Well, you know, it's called, I think, living the message. Yeah. You know, you can, you can, you can give yourself advice, but you can really live the lesson. <laughs> and from what I see with you and your mission, you're living the lesson. You yeah. know? Sometimes the best lesson is just be an example. Be an example. Be, 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 be the model. <laughs> so it's yeah. like, and as I look at it, I mean, the stuff that I've been doing, I've been doing it since I've been 15, 16. I've always, since I've been 15, 16, I've always been a leader. Mm, yeah. So that, ha that has not changed. Yeah. You know? And I, and I mean, I was 18 and we have guys around the block, you know, community, people never really went anywhere. Yeah. Here is, I'm like, okay, I got together with my friends. I'm like, what we're going to do is that we're going to rent a bus. Uh -huh. We're going to take a trip to Great Adventures for the community. So we're going to have the community, you know, purchase tickets. And we're going to Great Adventures because people didn't travel. People didn't leave their communities. They didn't leave their blocks. Yes, yes. You know, wow. So and this is stuff at 15, 16, I was doing. I was 15, 16. I'm walking in the parks with my daishiki on how to better your life. Yes. I've been involved in drugs. Yes. You know, and talking about the importance of school at 15, 16. So wow. even yeah. people, when they see me now, they're like, you haven't changed. I yeah. Have. <laughs> <laughs> you see, I just keep getting better. <laughs> yeah, I, ha I haven't changed. So that core, yeah. that core person is still there yeah. in terms of, but the core, at the essence of everything is that I've always been a leader and um, yeah. my leadership has not changed. I've always, I don't, I, I don't follow people. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't, I'm not led by, I can be around a group of people who are drinking, smoking. It has nothing to do with me. That doesn't mean I'm going to drink or smoke. Yeah. That's not yeah. what I do. Yeah, I got you. <laughs> now, if we look down, if we look down the line, say 25 years, based on where you are right now, and, and, because see, this is like a whole new evolution. You spent many years as an educator, and now you're a, a nonprofit um a ceo a teacher a mentor and if you look down the road 25 or 30 years what advice would your older self give to you about what you're doing right now mm, um what advice would the older me give to me in terms of i guess if if the older me would say it took you long enough to really understand that you know you can't do it all by yourself mm. You know, wow. so in order for you to grow, you have to let go. Wow. Now that's profound. That just sent a chill right down my <laughs> back. <laughs> bad, bad. Well, Derek, you know, we have this has been a, an incredible, I call it an hour of power. And is there anything else you, you'd love to leave with our listeners? I know that people are gonna really listen to this because there's an authenticity, you know, like there, someone once said, don't ever take flying lessons from not, someone who's never flown a plane before, <laughs> you know, <laughs> don't like coaches who never played the game, <laughs> you know, and so any final words for our audience, you know, based on where you are and, and some of the things you'd like to share and, and be sure to give your website. Yes, definitely. In regards to Real Death Network, I just have to say in terms of the brothers that we have, you know, and I'm, you know, I'm just one of the ones in terms of the network, but we just have, I mean, some phenomenal, phenomenal brothers um, that are part of that real dance club, that is part of this network, um, that who would give, they constantly give and they want to serve. Mm. You know? So um, we are just, we're servants, you know, and we're just trying to do our job as servants. And we're here to do whatever we can to just uplift our families, uplift our communities. So we're just here. We are a network. And what is the website for the organization? Website is um, realdadsnetwork.org. Realdadsnetwork.org. We'll make sure to put it on the... Instagram as well, Real Dads Network. Okay. Well, Derek, this has been a, I have enjoyed this. Man, didn't the time go by fast? <laughs> yes, I'm like, oh my gosh, it felt like five, 10 minutes. Yeah. But thank yeah. you for also for just, you know, for this conversation. I really appreciate it as well. Well, we're going to be sharing it. And uh, when you get it, I think that when people hear it, they're going to 
see something that they want to support. Uh, I'll just say that. It's good. Oh, well, thank you. I really appreciate it. Oh, yeah. They're going to see something they, that they want to support and understand that somebody's doing something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that I think that's the key that many times when we lose hope and when we look at the environment, yeah. you know, it's always good to know that somebody's doing something. Yeah, yeah. And, and so, it's like, I, it's important. I always say, you know, if everybody's just do a little part, then no one is left doing the whole thing. We all have the capacity to do something. Wow. Well, Derek Phillips, I want to say this. Thank you for being a part of Success Talk. To our listeners today, this is one of those um, programs that you're going to, you want to listen two or three times, and you're going to want to share this with some of your young people and people you know who need to know that there's hope, that there's, that there's a, a place that men can go and, and be welcome and and be able to let their, well, you and I are both balls, so letting our <laughs> hair down. <laughs> but we can take our hats off. But come in and, you know, just experience that authenticity to be vulnerable, to say, hey, you know what? I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> you know, you guys seem to have figured it out. You know, let, let me just sit at your feet. And, and learn. So thank you so much, Derek, for what you've done. The country appreciates you. The, the Our people appreciate you. And trust me, you are making the world a better place. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Thank you. All right. Friends, friends, people who love the success talk, remember, you can be what you want to be, do what you want to do, and have anything you desire, always knowing that the best is yet to come, and so it is.